Thank you very much. Good morning and thank you for attending the Army National Guard seminar, Recruiting, Training, and Organizing the Army National Guard of 2030, hosted by the 22nd Director of the Army National Guard, Lieutenant General John Jensen. Lieutenant General Jensen is, uh, it guides the formu formulation, development, and implementation of all programs and policies that affect the Army National Guard, a force of nearly 330,000 soldiers across the 50 states, three territories, and the District of Columbia. General Jensen previously served as the 31st Adjutant General of the State of Minnesota, and prior to that, the CG of the 34th ID, St. Paul, Minnesota. He was dual-hatted as the Deputy Commander and Army Reserve Component Integration Advisor, United States Army Africa and South Southern European Task Force, U.S. Africa Command, Vicenza, Italy. General Jensen has commanded at the com company, battalion, brigade, and division levels. His operational assignments include Operation Desert Spring, Operation Joint Forge, and Operation Iraqi Freedom. General Jensen is joined today by two state adjutants general, the commanding general of the 38th ID and the director of Army National Guard Installations and Energy. Uh, the director will introduce them momentarily. This will flow by General Jensen uh, 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 providing an overview of today's program. And then each of our guests is going to present on various initiatives and priorities from across the Army National Guard. Uh, and now I turn it over to the director of the Army National Guard, sir. Okay. Hey, thanks, Rob. I appreciate that. And first off, just like to thank everybody for uh, uh, being here this morning and participating in the Army Guard uh, seminar. You know, really, uh, as we were as we were developing what we wanted to talk about today, uh, what we did was we we went back to uh, Secretary of the Army uh, Secretary Wormuth, Wormuth's February 2020 memo where she laid out her six uh, objectives for the United States Army in support of the Army's priorities of people modernization and, and, and readiness. I, I won't read through uh, those six uh, topics, but or those six objectives, but what we tried to do is take, you know, tie into that obviously as, a, as our secret, secretary, and then also inside of AUSA's theme this year, which is building the Army of 2030. And so I'll introduce our panelists today, uh, starting to my left, the Adjutant General of, of Ohio, Major General John Harris. John's uh, a lifelong uh, Ohio Guardsman, enlisted in 1981, commissioned in 1984. John and I have known each other uh, probably for uh, at least a decade, if not longer, uh, working at several readiness advisory committees and special projects inside of the directorate. Uh, of the Army Guard and then and then serving together as adjutants general. John also serves as the vice president for Army Affairs for the Adjutant Generals Association of the United States. To his left, uh, another longtime friend, uh, Major General Tim Tomlinson. Uh, Tim's currently serving as the commanding general of the 38th Infantry Division and has been doing so since uh, December of 2020. Uh, growing up in the 34th Infantry Division, it just seemed like the 38th and the 34th were following uh, one another in training exercises and deployments and such. And so Tim and I uh, have known each other for quite some time. To his left, uh, Brigadier General Stephanie Horvath. Stephanie is uh, a Minnesota Guardsman, our one traditional Guardsman uh, on the panel today, originally a member of the North Dakota National Guard. Uh, but uh, Steph and I worked together in Minnesota. Uh, certainly my highlight, I don't know if she would describe it as her highlight, uh, Steph served as the G6 as I was the G3 for the 34th Infantry Division uh, when we deployed to uh, Basra, Iraq in 2009-2010. And as a traditional guardsman, I think it's also important just to note that uh, Steph's current position inside of the Minnesota Information Technology is Chief Business Technology Officer for the Minnesota Boards, Councils, and Commissions, and the Enterprise Program Management uh, Office. And, uh, and then finally, uh, a stand-in, uh, Colonel Anthony Hammond uh, found out last night that he was going to be a panel member here when our previous <laughs> panel member uh, had to step out. Uh, uh, and so Anthony Hammond, uh, lifelong Arkansas Guardsman, uh, currently serves as the Chief Army National Guard uh, G9. Now, the topics we're going to talk about today, uh, just very quick, and I apologize, I should have done this as I introduced our panelists, uh, but John Harris is going to talk uh, uh, about recruiting and retention 
in the, uh, in the Army National Guard. Those of you that have heard me speak about priorities for the Army National Guard uh, and strength, uh, a function of recruiting and, and retention, I've described as our uh, most pressing and key uh, pri pri priority and, and certainly will, will help lead us into the Army of 2030. Uh, Tim Tomlinson in his role as a, as a division commander is gonna talk about uh, really kind of the, the, the reorganization of the Army Guard under uh, division headquarters once again. He's gonna talk about Army National Guard division and division way ahead to 2030. Uh, and then Steph Horvath uh, is gonna talk about data centricity. What is it? That's exactly what I asked, Steph, what is it? Well, Steph, maybe you'll answer that question this morning. And then Colonel Hammett uh, will be talking about the Army National Guard implementation of the Army climate strategy. Again, these four topics tied to Secretary Wormuth's six objectives. So with that, uh, General Harris, I'll turn it over to you for your, for your opening comments. Thank you. Hey, thank you, sir. And I, I couldn't agree more that this is, uh, this is the greatest priority that we face as, as adjutants general, as National Guard leaders. I also believe, and I, I'm going to give you the perspective from, from my foxhole, from that of an adjutant general, so I'm not speaking on behalf of General Jensen or, or the Army staff, but simply giving you my perspective as, as, a, as a guy who's got, sort of out there on the front lines kind of grinding in this fight every single day. Uh, in Ohio Guard, we're about 16,000, about 11,000 of those are Army Guard, 5,000 Air Guard. And this is, this is a fight that we literally wake up thinking about every single morning. Um, this, this is our obligation to meet the challenge uh, of building cohesive, disciplined teams that are, that are fit to fight. Um, that's the charge, it always has been the charge, and now more important than ever, and we certainly can't get there from here if we look at the current uh, recruiting environment and the way that we're responding to that current and recruiting environment. I also think that uh, for the next few minutes, I'm gonna focus more on recruiting than retention. We've had a pretty good retention year. Uh, our attrition as, a, as Guard Nation was just over 11% against a, a, a cap of 13%, so we still way, stayed way under that. So I'm gonna spend my time talking about what I think is the true existential threat, which is, which is really enlist, enlisted accessions and, and, and overall recruiting. I also believe, and this is an editorial, but I believe that the Guard is probably in the best position to help solve this problem, uh, number one, because we represent America uh, we know the challenges of America. I think we have an obligation more than, more than anyone else to ensure that our ranks are representative of our communities uh, so that when we go to the fight, the communities go with us, community sentiment goes with us. But more importantly, we have an obligation to all those young men and women in our communities who can benefit from our military service. Moreover, we have 54 laboratories out there uh, that uh, 54 adjutants general who have the authority to experiment to get after solving this problem. I think it's very important that uh, when, we, when we test cases and we find things that work, uh, that we very rapidly disseminate those, those lessons learned across the force and get after uh, implementing them as quickly as possible in other, in other across, across the rest of the force. Here's what I mean by that. Uh, Dale Lyles, for example, uh, tag, of, tag of Indiana, implemented a policy over the last fiscal year that he was gonna to live to the social contract 39 days and no more. And if you intend to work your folks more than 39 days of the fiscal year, you had to get approval from the TAG. And so we would expect that to have some pretty significant uh, impacts on the, on the retention in the state of Indiana. And now that the fiscal year's closed, I'm very anxious to find out how that went. And uh, if in fact it did go well, um, what lessons we could learn from that, how we, how we share those lessons across the force very rapidly. And if it didn't go well, quite frankly, then we've got to fail quickly and get on to something else. But uh, again, as, as 54 laboratories for this sort of experimentation, I truly believe the Guard's in the best place to, to get after solving this problem. We know that we're facing headwinds. There's absolutely no doubt about it. And, and the one that comes up most often is this discussion about propensity to serve. And I will share with you that I think, first of all, we can't think of this propensity issue as, as a monolithic challenge that we can't overcome. It's very important that we dissect it and figure out what really contributes to this propensity to serve and get after solving it. But sometimes it seems like that big monster out there that we, DOD, and, and the services are gonna have to wrestle with and it's insurmountable, but it's really not. So uh, I, just don't, I just don't accept that propensity to serve is decreasing and something that we have to live with. You know, if we look at the factors that really co contribute or 
or, or shape this propensity to serve, probably one of the most important is, is that we are a smaller force and, and fewer young men and women have family members that, that have served and encouraged them to serve. In fact, in 1995, 1995, 40%, little over 40% of young men and women had a parent that had served in the military. That was 1995. In 2021, that same statistic was down to 13%. So that household encouragement, uh, that household experience, even the household awareness or knowledge of what military service really is or what it's about, <laughs> is certainly dwindling and, and contributing to that tendency for young men and women to serve. Again, I don't think that's insurmountable, but we have to accept the reality. First of all, what a household is, it's certainly not the same as it was in 1995. Uh, if we look at our, our, uh, our people of color, especially black communities, 72% of kids that are born today are born single family households. So the way we perceive families, the way we communicate with families, the way we influence families around military service has to adapt with that statistic. But again, I don't think that's overcome, over, not overcomable. I think one of the greatest challenges around this, this propensity to serve issue is just a lot of misguided messaging. Uh, during a, serve, a recent survey that was done by uh, the, o, the uh, OSD, Office of People Analytics, they surveyed military age folks, and then this survey, it was 16 through 24 year old young folks, people approaching military service. And 57, 57% 57 of those young people believe that if you served in the military, that you would leave the military with some sort of emotional or psychological damage. 57% of the young people surveyed believe that. And, and in that same survey, I think it was like 45% of those young people believed that if you joined the military, you were gonna have trouble readjusting when you came out of the military. And over 40% of that same population believed that if you served in the military, you were gonna come away with, this, with some sort of physical disability or, or, or injury. Now those are tough, tough statistics to overcome. And quite frankly, we know that they're not reality. But again, the messaging that I think our young people are receiving, if you watch television commercials during most major sporting events, and I love our not-for-profits that support our, our military, but just about every one of those is, is in, order to, in order to achieve their objectives, right? In order to achieve their objectives, they're depicting folks who are injured or, or ill as a result of military service and how their not-for-profit helps them. And if we look at the, the, that messaging time and time again, what counters that messaging? So there's, there's no surprise that 57% of young people believe that if you serve, something bad's gonna happen to you as a result of your military service. And we know that's not true, but how do we, how do we counter that message? It's really about building back, building back the trust. I found there, there's very little messaging out there about, how, about the resources that we've put behind responding to sexual assaults, about how our, our soldiers are trusting us more and that's resulting in an increase in reporting of sexual assaults. But the messaging comes across, there's an increase in sexual assaults in the Army, and, and if your loved one serves, they're gonna be sexually assaulted. That's, that's the takeaway. And we must, we must, we must counter that. Because again, that's one of those components that's, that's affecting propensity to serve. We also, if we look at the depiction of current events, uh, you know, we still, like it or not, we, DOD, particularly by our veterans community, we, we take some of the blame for um, the exit of Afghanistan. You know, the perception is we blew it. Right or wrong, that's a perception, and, and more than one person, you've heard it, more than one person has said that or believes that. How did, how did you guys let this happen? How, how would you guys not communicate better to your leaders? Uh, this is a, failed of a failure of military leadership to communicate to your leaders. You've seen article upon article upon article about that, and that's certainly shaping public perception. Not to mention the fact that many of the missions that, we accom that we're accomplishing and incredibly successful on today have become polarizing. The, the guards on the southwest border. And oh, by the way, if you read the, if you read the media accounts, you would think that, um, that it's, there's, it's nothing but... Uh, uh, disorder and chaos and di undiscipline on the southwest border by National Guard soldiers, because that's all that gets depicted. And of course, the, uh, you know, the Capitol, should the Guard have been at the Capitol's misuse of the Guard, you guys shouldn't have been there, you, you chose sides, which we didn't, and we know that. But all these missions are polarizing and certainly don't help perceptions for, 
for us when it comes to recruiting. And of course, uh, the vaccine mandate. You know, quite frankly, we as the National Guard, as I mentioned, should be more reflective of America than any other component because we are in the communities, we are of the communities, and quite frankly, we deploy the community to support the community. So being reflective of those communities we support is probably more important for us than ever, but uh, there, are, there are limitations and standards in DOD right now that make it tougher and tougher and tougher for us to do that every day. Uh, let's face it, you know, young men and women today, their, their, per their perceptions, their views on marijuana use is way different than it was for, for people of my generation, probably most of yours. You know, when we were in high school, we, we, we sneaked out and maybe had a beer, got away with it. That's, that's how they perceive smoking a joint and, and to be disqualified for that. You know that 44% of our people who go through MEPS, 44% of our young men, men and women who go through MEPS are disqualified for more than one condition. 44%. 11% are, are disqualified for being overweight and, the, and 8%, that single issue, just being overweight. And, and over 8% are disqualified for drug use. So it's the second highest, other than multi-factors, it's the second highest reason for disqualification. And let's not even talk about MHS Genesis and the impact of that. And I, I know we're gonna get that right. I'm confident we're gonna get that right, but right now it's an impediment to accessions. I had my recruiting force, my Army recruiting force, take a look at flash to bang time between contract to contact, contact to contract. That first, first contact, face-to-face -face meeting with an applicant to the time they raise their hand and say, I do. And that's 80 days. The average time is 80 days. And that's not all because of MHS Genesis, but that's certainly a contribution. And a, a young person changes their mind 30 times in an 80-day period. And by the way, uh, I had my air guard do the same thing, and it's almost identical, almost the exact same time. And, and, and we were losing a lot of applicants in that window. So, so what are the solutions? I think that as we move forward, we have to, we have to ensure that, uh, that, of course, and I know General Jensen's all over this, but as we look at future palms, we have to make sure that we're palming the right resources. And I'm not talking about just for bonuses. Typically when we, tend, we talk about palming, we talk about, we, the first thing we talk about are how do we palm for bonuses. Bonuses are a short-term solution and don't solve the problems I'm talking about here. Accession bonuses and retention bonuses. While they provide a short-term fix, they do not fix the underlying conditions that are impacting our ability to recruit and retain today. Uh, so, so when I'm talking about palming, I'm talking about palming for the right size recruiting force. I'm talking about palming for the right marketing dollars and with the right messages. And, and quite frankly, when it comes to the right messages, I love the strategy, sir, that, that, that you and the building has undertaken because they push an awful lot of marketing dollars to the state. The preponderance of the marketing dollars are pushed out to the states. And we have to make sure we're using those. It's great to, to print banners and uh, to have smoke machines at football games, but, but how are we reaching out using NCSA and other, other venues for, for radio pieces, uh, putting successful soldiers, not just recruiters, but successful soldiers who tell their story on radio, local TV, that sort of thing, and making sure that we're countering the, those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of messages that are affecting our ability to recruit. How are, how are we using those marketing dollars to reach out to make sure that our, our, success, our, our hundreds and thousands of successful soldiers are telling their story? And, and, and how are we linking, how are we linking um, what we're doing with, with bonuses and retention and with our skills to those high in-demand jobs that are available in your state right now that you're having a tough time filling that pay good, good middle wage salaries and incomes. We've got to leverage these opportunities to tell our story and to get our young folks in our ranks. Again, it's not just about bonuses. Um, and, and you know, we have to also, you know, I intend to, as we grow our prevention force, I don't know about the other adjutants general in here, but I'm inheriting, I'm getting about a, in the end, I'll have about 15 new positions on my Joint Force Headquarters staff. And if I, were, if I had my druthers, that's not where I'd be growing right now in my state. That's not where I'd be putting additional resources, but that's where the resources are coming. So we've got to use those resources to reach out to the community, not just for prevention efforts in our staff, but also reaching out in our, to the, 
prevention specialists in our communities to make sure that we're messaging what's really happening in the guard, to make sure that we're, we're messaging that it's not, it's not just doom and gloom for our young folks that join the guard, that we're here to support them. And when our people leave the guard, they're leaving the guard better mm -hmm. than when they joined our ranks, not worse. And then last, I think we have got to, we have got to get behind duty status reform. This is an important thing for, I think, for long term for retention. We thought it was coming. Um, we were right on the cusp of it, and uh, it, it fell by the wayside because of um, some issues with funding and some, uh, some things that were stripped out by OMB. But for long-term retention of our force, we've got to get benefits parity right. We've got to get duty statuses right. We've got to get insurance coverages right, and duty status reform is the right way to get that done. So we have to get behind that legislation. I'm talking to adjutants general now to get that legis legislation passed to get to get duty status reform fixed, and that's all I have for now. I'll be uh, I'll be here for question and answer if you've got anything around the issues that I just talked about. Thank you very much, and thank you, General Jensen, for the opportunity to, to present. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, John. Thanks for your passion uh, and your leadership as it relates to, to this topic and and a lot of other uh, topics. And our, our next our next presenter, Major General Tim Tomlinson. Again, is going to talk about Army Guard divisions and the way ahead for 2030. Tim, thank you, sir. Hey, uh, it's a it's a great time to be one of eight Army National Guard division uh, commanders as we reestablish the division uh, across the nation uh, as the unit of action and move away from the brigade-centric coin uh, back to the division-centric environment. So. So while it's, it's a great time to be in a command position, it's also an important time uh, to be in, in a command position as we, we strengthen that apparatus uh, to be a viable asset for the Army and for the national defense strategy uh, that, uh, that we can be counted on uh, to provide eight divisions to wherever we're at on the uh, spectrum of conflict uh, to include large-scale combat operations as we frequently practiced through warfighters, through CTC rotations, et cetera. So uh, I'm going to step back a couple years uh, to start and say uh, two years ago, uh, we went on a mission to make sure every division headquarters had aligned to it at least three brigade combat teams, a maneuver enhancement brigade, a combat aviation brigade, and a sustainment brigade. And we did that with a geographic lens uh, as the weighted criteria. And then we had to pause for a minute and say, well, we probably need armor heavy divisions and light divisions out of the structure we have in the National Guard. So, uh, so we did version 2.0, I'll say. And uh, so now we're postured with two armor divisions, uh, five light divisions, and one composite uh, light striker division across the United States with the uh, the light divisions are pretty geographically centered um, state-wise, but all divisions are crossing state boundaries. Uh, our two armor divisions are a little more dispersed. Uh, but what each of the divisions now bring back into the Army fold uh, are some histories. And so in the 38th, uh, every component of the 38th uh, Infantry Division, as it is reassembled today, uh, fought in the Philippines on the island of Luzon in the Second World War. The 37th uh, Brigade Combat Team from uh, Ohio, General Harris's uh, state, uh, fought hand-to-hand, -hand, door door-to-door through Manila. Uh, the 76th Brigade's lineage, Indiana National Guard, uh, was part of the 38th Amphibious Landing that turned south and liberated the peninsula of Bataan. And with that organization was the 149th Infantry Regiment, uh, which now belongs to uh, our friends in Kentucky, uh, General Hal Lamberton, as the Maneuver Enhancement Brigade. And also on the island was the 33rd Division at the time, now the 33rd IBCT from Illinois uh, that turned north and uh, destroyed the remaining command post in the northern jungles of the island. So those brigades now, I call it getting the band back together that we did two years ago, are now part of the Avenger of Bataan Division, 38th Division. Uh, so each of our eight divisions uh, has some heritage piece like that that we bring back into the Army now mm -hmm. as we look at 
division-centric operations. So now that we're organized, uh, our next task is really to modernize. And uh, the step that we're in the midst of is moving to a K-series MTO or a MTO change, which is gonna bring some more staff functionality into space, cyber, and electronic warfare, posturing us better for multi-domain operations. Though we won't have the capability necessarily to execute, we will have the staff functions inherent in our formation that can understand, speak the language, make the request, do the interactions uh, with multi-domain task force on, and apply uh, those pieces to uh, the division fight. So, in, and modeling shows that we will perform best when brigade commanders are fighting the close fight and the division is synchronizing these assets uh, for the deep fight and shaping. The next, the next modernization uh, currently ongoing with three Devardis established division artillery brigades and the remaining five to be established uh, prior to FY28. So uh, in the 38th, uh, our new commander, Colonel Jones sitting in the front row uh, will take the flag at the 38th Division Artillery here in a few weeks. Uh, the 34th is already uh, established and we will get uh, the Division Artilleries reestablished uh, in the Army National Guard structure. Uh, next modernization step is uh, either converting or fielding uh, intelligence and electronic warfare battalions. So in four cases supporting four divisions, we will convert a uh, existing MI battalion uh, into an intelligence and electronic warfare battalion. And in the other four divisions cases, we will field new uh, structures. So the conversions will happen uh, 25 and 26, and the new structure fieldings uh, 27 and 28. So what we're now posturing with uh, a modernized force structure uh, and then we'll, we will modernize with the Army and other areas as that becomes more apparent. And what we really have to do is stay engaged as to what the modification of the brigade combat team is on the light and, and motorized side and, and how that works and how we uh, reestablish division cavalry. So really what we can do there is be engaged with CAC, with TRADOC, and in forums where uh, they offer us regularly uh, a voice and a vote on how we would like that structure to go forward. So we will, we will work that uh, into the future, into the Army of 2030 and the divisions of 2030 and beyond. And then if we take uh, the R out of rearm uh, regional, we, if we grab that going forward, the uh, Army National Guard issued uh, the rearm order, which align four divisions uh, geographically, uh, pointing two towards uh, Europe and Fifth Corps and two towards uh, the Pacific and First Corps. So uh, as we advance and establish those relationships, those divisions will work then with the established multi-domain task force that are established uh, under those uh, Army Service Component Commands and Combatant Commands in those theaters through repetition uh, and modernization. And so, so we have, we have a way ahead, we have a plan. We'll continue with repetitions of large-scale combat operations through divisions of warfighters, bringing those maneuver enhancement brigades, uh, combat aviation brigades and sustainment brigades into that habitual rotation. Um, we can't always get our brigade combat teams in there, but what we do is uh, two brigade combat teams per year have a CTC rotation and four to five others have an XCTC rotation. So we'll, we'll find uh, lessons learned. We'll early implement techniques uh, to move to 2030 and uh, we'll continue to practice. So uh, I look forward to your questions. That completes my opening remarks. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. I, I appreciate that lay down of, uh, of the 38th Infantry Division. Uh, that little historical perspective, I think, uh, is, is fascinating. Uh, our next panelist member uh, that will, will speak again on data uh, centricity is uh, Brigadier General Steph Horbath. Steph. Good morning. Uh, so I get the fun, uh, the fun ambiguous term of data centricity. <laughs> 
it's an approach to software development, application development, which we know all our entire world, our civil society is all based on use of applications. And so this approach is where the data is at the center. Now what's implied is what happened to the program, where's the software, where's the coding? In, in, in data centricity, the software program is ephemeral for any Scrabble lovers out there. Um, ephemeral, it's, it's short lasting, uh, it's constantly changing. And this is by design. And I understand it's a little bit of a squishy term, so get, let me give you two tangible examples, operational use by states to really kind of show the benefit and value of data centricity. Okay, the first example is about state active duty pay, pay to the soldiers who are performing state active state active duty. We know that states, many states, are increasing state active duty deployments for National Guard soldiers for emergency response. COVID relief, civil unrest, hurricane relief support, uh, fires. We are seeing an increased number of soldiers that are on state active duty. There is not uh, one good application that accurately records a uh, soldier's performance connects to DFAS to make a payment for the, for the act of duty performed that is in line with the state or territory prescribed payroll processing. Now that was an issue, it's been an issue for many years when, when state act of duty was infrequent. Now it is a, a larger issue. And the state of Minnesota, like many states, looked for a solution. After reviewing what was out there on the market, uh, they went with an in-house development. The state of Minnesota, J6, in the data processing was able to develop an application that accurately records a soldier's performance from the, from the day of incept, you know, when the day they start the active duty to the end of duty, uh, providing multiple benefits, uh, an accurate personal status reporting to the commander, and then even more importantly, an accurate and timely payment to the soldier following their performance when they came off of uh, duty, you know, so when we, when we activate soldiers, we pull them from their work, we pull them from their families, it is nice to know that we now have the ability to pay them for the service that they have rendered. From a project management perspective, application project management perspective, it's quite stunning. The state of Minnesota was able to develop this application in four and a half months with four staff members only. And those four staff members were GS11 and GS12, so you can do the math. This is a very low cost uh, application. And they used infrastructure that was already in place, a web server and a, and a SQL backend server. They're able to ingest personnel records for Army, Air, civilians. They're able to connect and uh, ingest information from DFAS financing. And they were able to apply the business logic of state of Minnesota's financial system. And this, all of this work in four and a half months enabled not only accurate reporting, uh, minimal, greatly reduced administrative manual key entry and, and sending around spreadsheets uh, to execute the mission and then pay the soldier with an accurate and timely uh, automated electronic funds transfer. Okay, so that is data centricity, the ability to bring data together, quickly code a application for a specific need, a specific mission. Okay, second example comes from the great state of Texas where the J6 has assembled a data analytics team. This data analytics team was formed out of the knowledge management branch that was looking for better COVID uh, report tracking. But what happened, like many times in technology, when something is working and it's working well, it explodes. And now this data analytics team has put together 70 different dashboards. Now, I would love to talk about all, all 70, and if you want to, come find me after the panel. But the couple that are most relevant here today are the dashboards that were put together for the 36 infantry division commanders all the commanders, the battalion commanders, the brigade commanders, and the division commander, in order to understand personal, personal personnel issues, critical personnel fills. So when we're asking the question, or when the 36 is asking the question, is there a PA that can go with the brigade on a deployment? 
or is the PA involved in COVID missions? Because right now, we are dealing with simultaneous state and federal missions. That dashboard developed by the J6 pulls together all that information in one page. When the battalion or the division has to answer, do we have a 17 Alpha who's going to go on a deployment, or is that 17 Alpha in training, that dashboard can provide that information. That is data centricity when we are, when we are developing analytical tools that address commander's critical information requirements. Okay. So quickly, you know, what is data centricity? The ability to ingest the data, code around it that is very specific to commander's critical information needs, the mission, and also the operational environment. It is good to have those local, developer, local, local developers that are in proximity of the command post, right? So they can hear what are the information needs. They know, understand the mission more thoroughly and they quickly uh, translate that into an application or an analytic tool. And finally, most importantly, I think what we've seen with the data-centric applications developed by the states, they do not just identify the problem. They don't identify the problem that, well, security clearances uh, are low in this unit, or there's severe pay issues for soldiers in this unit. These applications prevent the problem from happening in the first place, or they work to isolate the problem and help correct the problem. Um, what what data centricity is not, it is not a consolidated or centralized application. As a matter of fact, data centricity is, is in many ways just the opposite. It is more distributed computing, uh, rapid application development. Consolidating and centralizing to one monolithic application uh, is fraught with issues. Access control issues, data quality issues, um, feature enhancement issues. Right now, we are seeing data quality issues in IPSA, as evident by the number of corrective memos that soldiers have to write to in when they are submitting their uh, up selection packet board. So if they're going to a promotion board or they're competing for a school and they have to submit a packet, we are seeing numerous times where the soldier had to write a corrective memo saying, I did attend this training, this is my personnel status, but it's not correct in IPSA. What else? Um, data centricity is not. It is not emailing spreadsheets and, a, and, and PowerPoint presentations. You know, the great songs of the 90s? I had to write this down because I couldn't remember any of them. But Meatloaf, I Would Do Anything for Love, and, and Aerosmith, um, I Don't Want to Miss a Thing. Those songs are, are timeless. But the technology from the 90s is not timeless. It is time to move the data analytics out of the mailbox. <laughs> and so finally, you know, how does data centricity uh, meet the Army campaign plan and, and the directives and the initiatives of our, of our leaders? First, the examples I gave to you today totally actualize uh, the Army campaign plan, people moderni modernization and readiness. When we developed an application that pays soldiers, in a timely fan, uh, fashion for their state active duty, that is the care of the soldier. That is taking care of the soldier. And that will increase the propensity for, to serve, as General Harris had mentioned. We believe that the applications that improve a, user, a soldier's experience will increase their propensity to serve and continue to serve in the National Guard. And we've already talked about you know, modernization, kind of creating something that didn't exist before and it reduces time, it improves accuracy, it increases operational efficiency. Okay. Now, there's just one more thing I wanted to bring, about, bring up about the Texas um, data analytics team and developing the dashboards for the division. What I think is very, um, it's almost like exponentially improving the use of data because not only when you look at the division staff, the division staff no longer has to deal with the flurry of emails and spreadsheets and PowerPoint presentations in, in pushing data that's not as relevant as, as if it is in one contained uh, record and everyone is using that same uh, data source in, 
in a variety of views. So now you've opened up your staff to do more analysis and do more division coordinating activities because they're not chasing the spreadsheets in the inbox. But there's also value in the fact that now the division is training on the use of dashboards. And now the division understands how to manage a higher volume of data. And we know that staffs have to manage a higher volume of data if they are going to execute major contingency operations and conduct uh, multi-domain operations. Pending any questions, sir. Steph, thanks. There's uh, two, two notes I'd like to make uh, as it relates to Steph. First of all, I didn't uh, introduce her uh, as it relates to her job position. Steph, uh, as of October of 2020, has been serving as the mobilization assistant to the Director of Operations, J3, United States Cyber Command. Note number one. Note number two, uh, you probably can't see it from where you're at, but Steph's notes are on her cell phone, her smartphone. Meanwhile, the three gentlemen to her right are still using paper and pen. So, uh, <laughs> uh, Steph, you're, you're, you are living your best life, and I, I appreciate that example. You have to have a backup, though. That's I still right, think it's good right, to have a backup. Right. And then finally, again, proof, uh, don't answer your phone during AUSA week when your boss is supposed to be on a panel. Uh, Colonel <laughs> Hammond is going to talk again about the Army National Guard implementation of the Army's climate uh, strategy. Colonel mm -hmm. Hammond. Uh, so first off, thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity. And, <laughs> uh, I want to thank General Balliet. And, uh, uh, she did bless me with notes last night at about 6 o'clock. So, uh, so, yeah, she said, uh, you'll do great. Uh, so I am Colonel Anthony Hammett. Uh, I am the Army Gu National Guard G9. I'm over all installations, environment, and energy activities. Uh, so anything that you guys do, whether training lanes, uh, whether training lands, new buildings, old buildings, uh, which I know that we have quite a bit of, uh, I impact or touch some of those in some way. So um, the thing that I'm going to talk about this morning is the Army climate strategy and a couple of uh, executive orders that may impact some of the things that you may want to do. So I'm going to go through some dates, go through some executive orders. If you want to jot them down, that's great. Uh, I will give out, I'll dime out my branch chief, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rob Fenton, who is my climate and energy branch chief who is working this and is uh, waist deep in working the climate change. Uh, so. Uh, Two things that I talked about, the climate strategy and the directives listed in the presidential executive orders, and that is 14008 and 14057. Uh, so for those of you that are not familiar with those executive orders, uh, 08 was signed January of 21. So it's all fairly new. We're still working through it. Uh, place the climate crisis at the forefront of foreign policy and national security planning efforts. It states the U.S. will work with other countries and partners, both laterally and multilaterally, to put the world on a sustainable pathway. Then in December of 21, Executive Order 57 was signed and established that the federal government would lead by example to achieve a carbon pollution-free electricity sector by 2035. Sounds a long way out, but when you're looking for my lanes, it's not that far out. Uh, and a net zero emissions economy-wide by 2050. Uh, shortly after that, in February of 22, the Secretary and the Army published a message to the force which detailed her top six objectives for the Army, and one of those objectives is continuing efforts to be resilient in the face of climate change. Later that month, she signed the Army Climate Strategy, the first of its kind in the history, and it was published to the field. Outlined within the strategy were three main lines of effort, installation resiliency, acquisitions programs, and training for extreme weather conditions. Some of the objectives include the optimizing of infrastructure resilience, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, adapting land management to climate risks, and securing future access to training and testing lands. Second line is the acquisitions program, basically looking at the ways to enhance operational effectiveness by reducing our resilience on fossil fuels, reducing sustainment demand, increasing operational and contingency basing, and strengthening climate resilience. Third line is for the extreme weather conditions, and those goals just include updating doctrine and training to prepare the Army for a climate-altered world. So within my portfolio, I manage the installations and facilities through the 54 states and territories and districts of Columbia. This includes roughly 2,400 readiness centers and 110 installations. We're also the second largest landholding command in the Army. 
So we work hard to ensure that we are in direct support of the line of effort number one, which is installation resiliency. One of the objectives outlined in the Army Climate Strategy under this line of effort is to have microgrids installed on every installation by 2035. These microgrids will allow installations to run critical infrastructure and systems for up to 14 days during an emergency or natural disaster. Of the 110 installations in the National Guard's inventory, only 14 of them currently have microgrids in place. We are currently working the plan for sourcing the remaining 96 installations with priority going to the MFGIs or the power projection platforms. Currently, we are working four microgrid projects, one at Camp Shelby, Mississippi, Los Alamitos Joint Training Base, California, one at Camp Mabry, Texas, and one at Camp Atterbury, Indiana. The microgrid at Camp Atterbury will soon be tested to ensure it can handle the installation's required electrical load during an emergency. We're looking at completion dates for the other projects around 2024. In addition to these projects already in the works, we're actively seeking an estimated $360 million in funding to install the additional 46 microgrids at various locations. At the same time, Army Reserve and Army are trying to do the same thing. Another objective supporting in installation resiliency is to field an all-electric all electric, non-tactical vehicle fleet by 2035. We are currently working with the 54 on transitioning their non-tactical fleet of GSA vehicles to an all-electric fleet within the Army National Guard. We have approximately 2,500 non-tactical vehicles that will need transitioning to electric. Meeting the goal of an all-electric fleet by 2025 does present some challenges. For example, right now we lack the infrastructure to support charging stations at our installations, our readiness centers, and our maintenance facilities. We estimate we would have to install approximately 1,800 charging stations in order for there to be adequate infrastructure to support an all-electric fleet. The estimated cost to install these charging stations is roughly $135 million. In addition to the challenge and lack of infrastructure to support these vehicles, we run the tyranny of distance within our states. And this is something I've actually talked to all senior leadership over in uh, OSD and ASA and uh, Army National Guard G9 and just the distance that we have to deal with. So we have duty where vehicles have short distances. Well, the active duty has vehicles that only have short distances to travel in our installations. We are spread miles and hours apart. Uh, we don't just need a vehicle charged to drive around Fort Hood or Fort Benning, and General Balliette stresses this all the time. We have places like Fort California, Fort Wyoming, Fort Texas, Fort Florida. That's what we push out to them. We are currently working with the Army G9 to allow the National Guard to look at using a combination of electric and hybrid vehicles. This will allow us to decrease fossil fuel consumption, reduce greenhouse emissions, and still work towards the goal of an all-electric fleet. We're also actively working towards expanding the Army Compatible Use Buffer Program, ACUB. This program is a voluntary system of local partnerships that preserve private lands adjacent to National Guard installations. This partnership allows for those lands to remain in its natural state, create a buffer that enhances the physical security for our installations, and stops incompatible development of land by outside commercial organizations. The Army National Guard manages 1.9 million acres of land across the 54 and has active ACUP programs in 12 of our installations located in 11 states. A great example of the success of the ACUP program is the one located at Camp Shelby, Mississippi. Their ACUP program is able to sequester the equivalent of 120,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide annually, or roughly 2,500 average households' carbon emissions each year. So not only do we need to look at our use of land, but we need to ensure that we are building energy efficient structures when designing our new facilities. Our goal for all new military construction projects is to achieve LEED Silver certification by the U.S. Green Building Council. This certification takes into account such things as the facility's energy savings, water efficiency, CO2 emission reductions, and the overall stewardship of resources. Because our budget does not allow for the replacement of 100% of our facility inventory, we must work every day to make sure our current structures are more efficient. We do this by using the latest technology and science to retrofit and modernize our existing facilities. For example, buildings are being retrofitted with energy efficient windows, low flow toilets, and lead lighting. We're using the latest in energy efficient building materials and installing facility control systems to help regulate the heating and cooling of our buildings. 
All of these efforts are helping to reduce greenhouse gases and get us closer to accomplishing the goals laid out in the Army Climate Strategy. The Army Guard is adhering to the Army Climate Strategy by constructing microgrid projects, incorporating alternate energy sources, transitioning to an all-electric non-tactical vehicle fleet, and retrofitting our facilities to improve energy efficiency and savings. As Secretary Wormuth has stated, climate change isn't a distant future, it's a reality, and it must be addressed now. We in the Army National Guard are doing just that. I would like to say thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Very good. Thanks, Anthony. And so what we'll do now is I'll transition over to uh, Le Lieutenant Colonel Rob Perino, and he'll moderate uh, questions uh, from the audience. So at this time, if you have a question, please identify yourself, and uh, Colonel Perino will call on you. Thank you. Sir, thank you, and uh, thank you also for uh, announcing Brigadier General Horvath's position. Earlier I had said that we have two adjutants general. We have one tag and one assistant J3 at U.S. Cybercom. So if anybody here has a question on data centricity <laughs> or anything else, I ask you to form up at the microphones, and I will call on you. Um, if you are a member of the media, a reporter, I ask that you hold off on your questions uh, because we are holding a media engagement around table in room 140 Bravo. Uh, following this, all of our guests will be there to take questions from media. Uh, so for uh, other members of AUSA, if you have any questions, please join us here at this time. Yes, please, sir. Hey, good morning. Greg Knight, I'm the Adjutant General from the state of Vermont. I see a lot of my fellow tags here. Uh, John, coming back to the propensity to serve, and I wanted to talk a little bit about what I'm finding, at least anecdotally right now. So I'm the Vice Chair of the National Joint Diversity Executive Council with General Barry, and what I'm finding in Vermont, and maybe really a microcosm, that propensity to serve is greater in the new American community. I can tell you the story of Hussein Sadiq, a young man, combat engineer, who's uh, from Somalia came here at eight years old and he was, what he told me was I couldn't believe I could have a glass of milk whenever I wanted. He's now in our guard going to UVM, University of Vermont, as an engineer, engineer student and we're paying. I can give you 10 stories like that off the top of my head. So for me as a guard, I'm certainly gonna do it in Vermont. I don't need anybody's permission. But I think as a guard, we're probably better served to grow our diversity and go after those populations that are underrepresented in our organizations. And the other benefit, John, you brought it up, you know what they don't have? A Genesis record. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there is that. Um, and the other thing I wanted to bring up, and I've been uh, banging the drum with my folks for a couple of years now, uh, we've really got to do a better job going after that prior service market. I know we have ISRs, that's great. Um, how aggressively are we as states? If I've got somebody, for instance, relocating to the Northeast, why aren't they considering the Vermont National Guard if they're coming off their first term in particular? Um, we're missing a global opportunity if we're really not going after that uh, full bore, as far as I'm concerned. Because Keystone enlistments, as you note, we, we look at the MEPS data that I got from the J1, General Jensen, you've certainly seen that. When you look at the success rate coming out of MEPS for a production enlistment off the field, I think the number was 67.9%. So within the Army National Guard, okay, I'm not a math person, but that's a third, pretty close. And then you add to that the 20% no-shows, that's starting to sound like 50% of the applicants that we're working, we either don't get them to MEPS or they don't make it through MEPS. But those are my observations, so we appreciate any leverage you can apply uh, to either. Uh, but we can grow our diversity, and I think, um, again, I'm gonna keep doing research on it, but we're growing it because the propensity to serve is there where it may not be with U.S. citizens that are natural born. Thanks. Thanks for the question. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, I, I would just say, I think I'd highlight uh, one thing uh, as it relates to, uh, you know, prior service. I think there's, there's, there's two parts of that population. There's the prior service population that leaves service completely and then, and then tries to come back. And then we have our active component to reserve component uh, transfer. Uh, and, and I will tell you, out of new enlistments, prior service enlistments, and that active component to reserve component, uh, 
we came closest in meeting the mission on AC to RC. Uh, and so uh, a lot of credit out there for our National Guard counselors that are at many, if not all of our active uh, component uh, installations. The other thing we're working with as it relates to prior service, as you're aware, we continue to work with uh, TRADOC uh, in order to shorten the training requirement for service members uh, out of the Air Force and the Navy as they transition into the Army National Guard instead of going uh, through a complete basic training experience having a shorter experience. We believe that that makes that transition more attractive uh, for non-Army and non-Marine uh, prior service soldiers. But uh, uh, acknowledge all your points there. Thank you. And sir, if I could add one thing. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree with you more, Greg, especially on the, on the diversity issue. Again, I'll go back to what I said. We ought to be reflective of our communities. And I think we ought to work the, the diversity problem backwards instead of saying, we need to go get more of these and more of these and more of these. We should first stop and ask ourselves, is, is, is my, are my formations reflective of their communities? And, and if they're not, then why? And if we have issues that are preventing those, those, uh, you know, the, the, those, those folks, this is their second nation, from recruiting them, what are they? Is it, do we need, is it, is it English as a second language? Is it the ASVAB? Is it, what are those things that are preventing those people from joining our ranks and we have all these diversity tools. What's the right tool in the toolkit to get after solving that problem? Sometimes we tend to collect tools to say that we have them, but what's the right tool to get after that problem? So again, we need to ask the question, are we reflective of our communities? If we're not reflective of our communities, what do I need to do as a leader to get us to that point, right? And, 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 and a couple of things have come up. I've talked to a couple of my fellow adjunct generals. This, this uh, ASVAB test, particularly English as a second language, is a huge, huge barrier for some of our communities out there. One other thing, if I could, uh, I think it comes back to messaging, and you, and you spoke about that earlier and kind of getting ahead of it. I think a lot of new Americans, uh, probably most folks in the state of Vermont, don't understand that if you are here as a lawful permanent resident, you can join the Guard, and that can expedite your citizenship process. So I think, again, it comes back to messaging and us getting that word out, but that's on us. Thanks. Uh, good morning. I'm Colonel Tuzar from French Army Reserve. Uh, my question is about uh, training. Uh, as you will uh, inc um, go into the division model, uh, MDO, that, will that mean more training to get to the right level of readiness? And that additional training, if how would it be compatible with a God's man life, sh having to share his work time between civilian and duty? Thank you. So, uh, yes, sir. So. Uh, you, you have hit on a very valid uh, concern. So our model is 39 days per year. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to uh, be a division commander that went through a warfighter exercise that uh, required some additional training. Um, we work that in a number of ways. Uh, some of our soldiers volunteer for additional days for additional training. Uh, and if they don't, then we honor the 39-day-a-year model. So it's, it's a lot. Um, but re really what you've got to look is holistically, what is the institutional army uh, going to provide for us through their education system? Uh, so, so they come in with that, and they plug that into the staff section or the formation. Um, and we then take that institutional knowledge and then we do the operational uh, reps through warfighters or command post exercises, et cetera. Um, it's, it's not easy. Uh, and uh, as, you, as you work that in the French Reserve, it will not be an easy answer there either because our constraint, both our, our greatest <coughs> asset is our people, our greatest constraint is the time. Uh, so we've got to be very good. I, I focus a lot on uh, Army FM70 unit training management, and that doesn't matter whether it's MDO or, or what it is, but if you plan and resource your training in advance, uh, uh, then you can get it executed within the time constraints. That's a great question, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, go ahead, please introduce yourself. Hey, good morning, Captain Andrew Hansen, 
I'm here in my, in my civilian capacity, but on the M-Day side, uh, company commander with 1st Battalion, 194th Armored Regiment, 1st Brigade, 34th ID. Uh, General Horvath, you signed my OCS commissioning uh, at the RTI in, in, in Minnesota, so it's good to see you again. Uh, so simple, simple question, but it may get it more complex. What issues or frictions do you foresee us getting into, going into Army 2030, specifically around people, talent, culture, and the knowledge base to succeed uh, with competing interests in the, in the commercial sector, pulling talent away from the Army? I think it's the National Guard is in a unique position to capitalize on soldiers that have talent in the civilian and the and the military, so uh, take it however you want. Yeah, uh, okay, so I'd like to break that up just a little bit and, and ask maybe uh, a couple of our panel members to talk about a, a particular piece of, uh, of this. Uh, as it relates to people, John, maybe you can take that part on it. Steph, uh, I'd like you to take the talent piece on this, and specifically, I think what you were talking about was local uh, local developers of data-centric applications. So how do, we, how do we attract that talent? How do we manage that talent? Uh, and, then, and then, Tim, if you could just take uh, the culture uh, piece of that. Does that sound good? All right, and then if we, if we don't get to the whole entirety of your question, please follow up again. So, John, maybe the, the, the people part of this thing in Army of 2030? Yeah, first, uh, I will, just a quick comment on the talent piece, I think that I, I couldn't agree with you more that, that the National Guard's the best place for that talent because a component, a, a thing that we don't, we sometimes don't talk about is how we also have this domestic response requirement making that talent available to the governor. Why that, while that may be cyber professionals or whatever, you name it, as we grow these new skill sets, um, we also have a requirement to respond uh, to our governors and to the people of our states also. So having that talent available, organized in an organized way and available to the governor is, is very, very important. I think that the most critical thing that we have to do between now and 2030 is build trust. And this is on the people side. Right? We have to rebuild uh, what, I, what I believe is, a, is an eroding trust because of the civil military divide, uh, uh, because of the polarization of this country, again, because of the politicalization of, of, of many of our mission sets. We have to be very deliberate about rebuilding or continuing or, or to stop the, the erosion of what appears to be the trust in, in, in our uniform services, particularly in our National Guard. Again, I think that goes back to being representative and representing our communities. But more importantly, and back to that same thing on messaging, we have to, and, and this, is, this, is, uh, this is both a recruiting and retention problem. Uh, if, if we, you know, we, someone mentioned self-actualized <coughs> soldiers, self-actualized individuals, I think it was in this, in this panel session. You know, if we look at Maslow's, hi Maslow's hierarchy, that's at the top of the pyramid. And if we can't take care of the basic things like safety, if we can't take care of things like paying bonuses on time, um, you know, keeping their IPSA stuff right, simple things like that, then we're at the bottom of the pyramid. And that may sound pretty trite, but the reality is, you know, we, if we can't take care of the love and the care and belonging piece, then, then shame on of us if we expect our service members, our soldiers, to be up here at self-actualization and doing PT between drills and all those other things that you demand of these high-performing individuals. Individuals. So again, it goes back to building the trust. Uh, it's tough to do. It's 63 percent full-time manning, um, and and I, 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 it sounds like I'm doing a commercial here. But the reality is, if we can't take care of the bottom piece of that pyramid, the foundation, paying people on time and taking care of them, then we're having a tough time building that trust at the top of the pyramid, getting the things that we demand from our soldiers. So uh, again, if I had a bumper sticker, I'd say our goal between here and now in 2030 is building trust, both within our ranks and within our communities. Okay, thanks, John. Steph. Okay, that's a really uh, significant question, right? Uh, getting at the, the people, talent, uh, retention. So I'm glad I signed your paperwork. Um, <laughs> In, 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 
My answer is, is going to be most about the, the technical or information workers that we want to try to retain. But we, we know that, oh my goodness, there's so many amazing folks in the, in the, in the Guard, whether they're engineers or teachers, uh, nurses, there's, there's all those wonderful skills. But in the tech world, you know, allowing uh, to develop and retain local developers, really, there's a couple things. One, to have some time to do some experimentation. Technology is really moving to open source. We've got applications that are exploding every day. And so when traditional soldiers or full-timers just have a little bit of time to think about a problem, and then they have some resources to actually experiment. So the experimentation is important. Interesting about the Texas uh, data analytics team, they developed a data analyst. <coughs> That person existed, was a full-timer, and was curious and growth mindset and taught themselves everything about how to be a data analyst. And then they developed a team. And we have to understand that just because you don't have that MOS doesn't mean you can't do technology, understand Python, or understand some sort of um, application. And then finally, I would say it's important to reduce the administrative burden whether on the, on the traditional soldier or our full-timers. If we can use data-centric cent centric applications that accelerate the uh, workflow, reduce manual entry, then we can maybe shift in focus to other activities. And so I think that's also kind of an indirect way in which we, hey, allow folks more time to experiment and understand and develop themselves. And that will drive that purpose and retention. Thanks, Steph. Tim. Hey, so I, I see this, this talent competition at a couple of places. Um, the, the first is company grade officers, the, the, just like you. So as, as our company grade officers move out of uh, college into the private industry, uh, uh, get married if they so desire, start to have children, start to advance on their civilian career, they hit this tough spot. And usually it's about captain to major. There's this hard spot, and, and this is not new. This was my generation as well. Uh, I think what's a little different now is the propensity to, to go ahead and check out and we lose an incredible amount of talent of company grade officers that leave the formation. And they go on to succeed in civilian businesses. They go on to be CEOs. Uh, they go on to own their own companies, which a, a lot of our guardsmen do as well. So I, I think there are a couple of ways, and then uh, I wanted to add, uh, I think we hit an NCO um, a talent piece there as well, somewhere E6, E7-ish. Uh, we kind of hit that same threshold. So I, I believe we counter this in, in a couple ways. We're, there is always going to be competition with civilian employment, family, and the guard uh, for our traditional force. It's always going to be there. So we have to provide predictability as a counterbalance to that. So the, the long war taught us some pretty bad habits. They taught us that, hey, we'll throw money at more training days, and we'll just expect that people show up. Um, money is not the answer, more training days is not the answer when we're, when we're looking at high performance individuals. Uh, competition predictability is, is, uh, is the problem. The other thing we have, and, and no one can equal, and it's why most of us are sitting in this room, is because we are a member of a team that has a purpose greater than ourselves. And in corporate America uh, cannot provide that. And so, so you got to kind of drive that intangible out there and say, say really, I, I want you to be a part of this team. I know you want to be a part of this team. Just this life is going through it. And usually when I talk to company grade officers or NCOs and that staff side, I say, if, if, if you push through this, there is, it, it'll come out all right. But uh, talent management is tough. Retaining talent, I think predictability and being a member of the team are how we counter it. Thank you. And then I would, I would just uh, close at least this part of this uh, with, with perception as well. And that we have to be very careful. You know, we're talking about building the Army of 2030. Uh, that doesn't mean the Army is going to stop changing at 2030, right? So 2030 is a waypoint to 2040, right? Building the Army of 2030 as we design and move out on 2040. 
So what we have to be very careful with is this perception that uh, if I'm not part of a modernization effort now, then I'm not relevant. Uh, and and, and what, what you hear senior Army leadership talk about is, is we're going to have a period of time where there's tiered modernization, not tiered readiness, tiered modernization. And, and, and I would say uh, that's the case across the Army uh, almost every year of its existence. Not every unit across the entire Army has the same level of modernization, whether it was 1995, 2005, or, or t uh, 20, 2030. So did we, did we get to your, your sweet uh, spot? Uh, yes, General. I think one follow-up is like, okay. what are some issues that keep you up that, you, that we haven't solved yet? Uh, like, like, that, I, yeah, what keeps me up at night, the issues that I, we haven't solved. I'm sure if it keeps uh, you up, it keeps all of us up, yeah, so I, we're all together, it's okay. Yeah, look, it's, uh, I, I'll be quite honest with you, it's how, how, do we, how do we maintain talent? How do we track and maintain talent, right? Uh, that, look, the United States Army is all about our soldiers, all about our families, and for the reserve component, all about our employers. And as, as Tim laid out, there's always friction between those, those, those three pieces of a reserve component soldier's life. Um, and, and that what we have to do as leaders is we have to take a long view of our organization and not a short view. It's not about your company command. It's not about your battalion command. It's about the organization and the organization in, in, a, in a life cycle here. And, and, and we can't treat today as the most important day in the history of our organization, right? We have to we have, to have a very long-term look at our, uh, at our organization. And we gotta be very, very careful. Um, sometimes, right, sometimes you have to uh, sacrifice the future for, for right now. Uh, my, my personal professional experience of that was uh, your organization as we were trying to get you ready to go to NTC uh, in the middle of COVID, right? And trying to protect you from having to do that duty because NTC was more important. When we initially had uh, civil unrest in, in, in Minneapolis after George Floyd was murdered, trying to protect your organization from that extra duty. But you know what, at some point we just had to do it. We had to potentially put NTC at risk to meet the, the closer obligation. Now, ultimately, it worked out uh, for us. I say that I didn't have to go to NTC like you did, but ultimately, it, it worked out for the organization. But those were all very deliberate decisions, looking at really what I thought was the best part, or the, uh, the, uh, the best interest of our soldiers and the organization of, of, of your formation. Okay. Well, thank you. No, thank you. Good morning. My name is Second Lieutenant Lady, and I'm from New Mexico. And now I'm here on a, a one-year ADOS tour at uh, the National Guard Bureau. Uh, during my time as enlisted, for three years as an E5, then I was in charge of the retention program in New Mexico, after which they sponsored a direct commission. Thank you, General Aguilar, uh, and, and my assignment out here. And so in that time, um, I did a couple things. One, I tutored approximately 100 people to try and join the uh, National Guard. Everywhere from uh, honor roll students to professionals that were in the community. And there was a commonality within that. And that was, we no longer know our times tables. And it seems such like minutia, but it's actually the difference between having someone raise their right hand, trying to tutor them for three months. And so if I may, and if you know, I apologize if not for the edification of the room, that approximately 1980, they did a pilot study of what the ASFAB mean should be set at. When we get a 50, that's not your score, that's what the average is, right? They took a collection of thousands of people and, and they tested them, they're like, and that's where your mean, that's where your average is, that's your 50. In 1997, I believe that pilot study was done again where they took the same number of people, the data set, and they, they redid the test and then they reset the average. If it has been done since 1997, I am unaware of that being changed. What has happened since 1997? I was a, a music educator for many years in Texas. And so since 1997, now even second and third graders are being handed calculators. You can bring calculators into the ACT, the SAT, even the high school GED equivalence program. 
And the only test that I'm aware of that you cannot bring a calculator in is the GRE. And with that, they give you a four-function calculator there on the computer. And so with that recommendation, then I would like a consideration of all the, the suggestions and the ideas I've had in my times in recruiting and retention and as an enlisted soldier for many years, is that I have two suggestions of things that would perhaps not be um, nominal when it comes to like a significant amount of dollars, you know, but something that can make a great impact would be the consideration of adding a four-function calculator. If you already don't know algebra, putting a four-function calculator won't give you that answer anymore. And if we're in the, if we think we're in the new age that we are, then we're just frankly not in the area where uh, you're going to lose a battle because you don't know what eight times seven is. And so those days are just kind of behind us. And so for something that can make a, a, a direct impact that could allow someone, because when I tutor someone for three months, we've already had this discussion that between that 90 and 80 and 100 days, and sometimes I've tutored for someone for over six months before they're allowed to raise their right hand, and then you're praying that something hasn't changed within their life that prevents them from doing so. So that would be my first consideration for that. And then if you would like to respond or if you'd like to also hear the second, I can do either. Well, uh, yeah. So. Quick response, see the Major General right to your right, Marty Bissell, look to your right, right there, right? Marty works at TRADOC. Uh, any suggestion and every suggestion you have, please give it to uh, General Bissell there before you leave this morning. But I have heard the Army senior leadership, uh, previous TRADOC commander, General Funk, talk that exact issue. Uh, and understanding, or trying to understand why, why are we putting this obstacle in place. And so I, from, from an Army perspective, and that's really all I can speak of, I, I know there's a lot of interest in, in doing exactly what, what, you're, what you're laying out is, is that um, it, why, why are we not allowing students to use uh, a calculator uh, on this? So I, I think there is some energy uh, behind that. All right, we're ready for number two. Thank you. So on the retention piece, again, of all the things that I would suggest, um, in my time in, in retention and things that perhaps could have an impact. One of the basics, one, basic one, we've already had an example for two years and it has worked successfully. And so when we're talking about the Maslow's hierarchy of needs on, on being um, competent in what we're doing and, and putting through paperwork in a timely fashion to get those bonuses, one of the things is during COVID, we were allowed to have an exception to where the dates and the signature type did not have to match. And I have brought this up in two retention workshops and, and got buy-in to, to everybody with everybody in the room in the 54 in that we would like a continuation of the policy because, for example, uh, first of all, to be completely candid, there have been times when we have had aviation deployed and as we saw uh, the previous year when, when bonuses went away at 11, 50, uh, you know, at, at, at midnight on June 30th, then we were at that point trying to just get people on the phone like, do you want me to sign, send a picture of your, of your signature? Like we were trying to do everything that we can to get them the, the, the bonuses, the student loan repayment that was so rightfully earned by these soldiers. And then also, we have hardships in New Mexico that I also saw was um, from our, our neighbors in Arizona. We still live in a society, in a world where not everybody has access to signatures. Getting onto the reservation, you know, to the Navajo reservation to get signatures all on a day, when they're ready to sign, it's kind of like on recruiting or attention, you know, we're the salesman, and when you have someone that's ready to buy, versus they come back a month later and they're like, hey, do you still want to sign? Well, now my spouse says that there, something changed in the dynamic. And so we already have a template for this. We're just asking for a continuation of that policy. We now have a data set of two years where there wasn't fraudulence. There, there wasn't any kind of nefarious acts that would make it you know, impossible or not, not a viable option. And so since it is something that would make it easier on both the people that are trying to garner the signatures as well as then the soldiers to get everything processed timely, that would be a small thing that could actually be impactful. Yeah, okay, very, very good suggestion. And, and, and Roy, I apologize. I, I know you're no longer in our G1 shop, but uh, Brigadier General Roy McElroy, uh Roy will take that uh, over to the Army Guard G1 team and, and we'll take a look at it. That, that's what I can promise you to see one, are we able to extend that? If not, why not? But we'll, I, think it's, I think you make some very valid points there, and we will certainly take a look at that, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got time for one more audience member. We have the good retired Sergeant Major. 
the enlisted National Guard associations. Good morning, sir. Uh, Matt Krenz, Enlisted Association of National Guard. So my uh, question ties into recruiting and retention again. So the, the question I want to have, sir, is what is the National Guard and writ large the Army doing to leverage our relationships with uh, employers across the United States? So as we sit there and talk about the, the needed relationships between service, family, and our employers, um, and the propensity that we have to serve, are we working through, uh, even if I take a look at the, the uh, you know, Fortune 50 companies, the Amazons, the Walmarts, that are desperately seeking the skill set that our military service members have to have them help us recruit for our service. And what I mean by that is we see a huge population of individuals that transition from active duty into these organizations because these organizations want a skill set. Have we looked at the possibility of saying, hey, these are the skill sets that military service members in the Guard have. Would you be interested if you have employees within your organization right now helping us pass the message and communicate at why a, a, a National Guard service would not only help us as an army, but also help you as an organization with those employees. To the panel members, uh, you want to talk about anything that you are doing at, at your state as it relates to, uh, to that effort? Well, you, well, yeah, first of all, we've got NGEPs on our staff who, f first of all, let me say I think that that this is better done at the local level than from the national level. I mean, the national level can certainly resource it, but this is really about, about relationships and, and getting in front of those CEOs and those HR departments, and, and, and that's a task that we've given our leaders because there's nothing like the brigade commander showing up to recognize an employer. Uh, there's nothing like our NG folks that are going in, sitting down with their human resources professional, doing that very, that very thing that you talked about, which is letting them know the benefits of a National Guard soldier leader um, coming into their ranks and then facilitating that relationship to include helping helping write resumes helping convert those military skills to to what it means to that employer to that specific employer writing it from army language to their language something that they understand so so i think that's very difficult to to accomplish on a macro level again it's got to be resourced from the macro level and i can tell you something that i think most of my fellow adjutants general are very aggressive about because of, of the need for that relationship. And quite frankly, when we talk about that, that CGO that gets to that, 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 bump, that point in their career where, where there's a friction point or that non-commissioned officer who gets that E6, E7 level where there, there's so many other life factors happening, that relationship with that employer becomes critical, critical at that point. Putting 2,300 people on state active duty for COVID to put into the hospital, those relationships become essential uh, because you don't, may not have the same protections at the state level. So I think it's something that adjutants general pay a lot of attention to. doesn't mean that we can't do better or do more. But uh, again, it, it's best accomplished, I think, at the local level. And, and engaging, engaging brigade commanders and CSMs, company commanders, CSMs, battalion commanders, CSMs, that makes a difference. That matters. And our, our partnership with ESGR, uh, they're still in the business. And uh, we tend to sometimes overlook them when we're not deploying. Uh, but they, they, they are looking, I can tell you, ESGR is looking for opportunities for outreach and to partner with us on, on outreach, and nobody's in a better position to do that than the, than the Guard because of the way we're structured in our states. You guys agree with that? Okay. I do. Hey, I, I think we undervalue our leadership training uh, that we get as soldiers, whether it's NCO or officer, or education system, either way. And... Uh, and in that balance, uh, you know, the, the, the service member is getting a value there and the employer is getting a value there. And I, uh, I agree with John that it's, I think this is best dealt with locally. And it takes some finesse to be able to have those conversations. But, um, but I, I think the leadership training we put our NCOs through and put our company grade officers through, those, those uh, corporations are, th what would they pay for the equivalent of ALC, right, as a leadership training. Tens of thousands of dollars, maybe maybe more. So. And, and someone mentioned this morning, I just want to point this out. Uh, I was one of my fellow adjuncts, you know, we, we tend to emphasize to the employer, listen, this is, this is great leadership training, this is what you get with a guardsman, but do we tell that story the other way around? Again, helping us build trust. This person is a member of the National Guard and their National Guard participation helped them uh, 
receive a promotion at work. Or they started as a in this position and now they're in this position in their guard leadership experience. So do we tell that story the other way to, to benefit ourselves? We work very hard. We work very hard to make sure that that they understand our our hiring our guardsmen, but do we do we leverage that to tell the guard story? Is there one? Is there oh, good stuff. So we uh, talk about skill sets. You know, the soldier brings a skill set to uh, uniform service, or they bring the skill set to work. I think we should start talking about personality traits. I mean, this is we know that service members have phenomenal personality traits. They're very dedicated, they're responsible, and they show grit. You know, Angela Duckworth's grit, um, perseverance, and passion for long-term goals. Those personality traits. Uh, is what drives a person to perform, whether in uniform or out of uniform. And as far as like the relationship between you know Army National Guard and employers, it, it does require engagements. And the state of Minnesota has had a blue ribbon beyond the yellow network for many, many years. And beyond the yellow network is a formal recognition, a company who demonstrates they support military, they hire military, they're at uh, transitioning and career fairs. When they demonstrate that they are uh, military friendly, they are actually recognized and celebrated, and it's a decree signed by the governor. And it's a big formal recognition for that employer who, who goes the extra length for service members. They provide those benefits to service members. So I think having some sort of way to formally recognize employers is a way to actually um, build that relationship and then have those conversations at those ceremonies with employers to understand what you know what's happening and so some sort of formal recognition for employers is key I'll finish there okay thanks hey uh, two two items here uh, as we as we close out item number one uh, if we could just have a round of applause for our panel members here <laughs> John, Tim, Steph, uh, Anthony, thanks for thanks for your time today. Thanks for your preparation today and, and your passion. And finally, point number two, just a reminder, at 1700 this evening, the National Guard Reserve Reception, room 150, Bravo. Uh, we will reconvene. So with that, Rob, I'll turn it back over to you for a closure. Roger that, sir. Thank you again, everybody. And uh, just uh, for your awareness, uh, General Jensen and, and our guests will have no more than 10 minutes to remain here. Uh, uh, so please take that into consideration as you, you know, say hello and, uh, and, and chat some more. Uh, sir, thank you very much again. Thank you.